Just one breath, you awaken life in me. You open my eyes, now I've seen you face to face. One moment of love, now I'll never be the same. Holy Spirit.
has invaded my heart Consumed me and made me new How could I live but to live for you? Ooh, ooh. I'm leaving my past behind Freedom in Christ is mine Only live for me, I only live for you
go. You are faithful. You are true. I'm a witness. I will shine for you. You are faithful. You are true. I'm a witness. I will shine for you. You are faithful. You are true. I'm a witness. I will shine for you. You are faithful. You are true. I'm a witness. I will shine for you. Hi, welcome to everyone and thank you so much for joining us this morning on our Family Together online service. I'm Pastor Sam Kiong, the lead pastor of the Workplace Church Plant and I'd like to welcome you who are especially first-timers who are joining us this, for this service. And if you've been coming regularly, welcome home. Well, this weekend is special and you know why? It's Father's Day and the scripture says, children are a heritage from the Lord offspring a reward from him like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them and indeed all of you who are out there you would run to the defense of the man who is your father whenever he meets his challenges and because of that they will not be put to shame when they contend with the opponents in court truly the fathers are blessed because of you so whether you are a father a father to be a grandfather or even a great grandfather or perhaps even father-in-law. Today is a special day for you and happy Father's Day. I thank God for the technology that keeps us connected, though we may be miles apart. If you are watching us from the YouTube channel, don't forget to subscribe to it. And there is also a link that you can send to your friends, inviting your friends to join us for this church service has never been easier. So if you are comfortable out there, don't be too comfortable on your sofa. Do stand up and join us during the worship and be engaged. We have an online chat. Light up the chat now and tell us where you're watching us from. We're going to start with presenting to you the SIB KL News. Jesus said in Matthew 18 verse 19, Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. In line with this, SIBKL will be hosting a midnight prayer altar via Zoom, happening every Friday from 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Let's gather online to pound the doors of heaven and seek the Lord for strength in these times of challenge and change.
will not say now I want you to start a cancer support group and I asked the Lord why the Lord said you know as you start no you'll be refreshed you'll be comforted and when you pray for others you yourself will get the healing I say wow Oh, so I quickly started the cancer support group, and the cancer support group was called El Piso, and I just served God, you know, from July 2007 to August 2008, and after about one year, I went for a CT scan, and my goodness, lo and behold, all cancer cells disappeared. It was such a miraculous healing. The doctor was awfully surprised. You know? Then I said, oh God, thanks so much. Thank you, thank you. Right. Now. So truly, you see, the act of faith had released God's supernatural power of healing into my body. So we need to have that hope. When we have the hope, we have the faith. When we have the faith, we will act according to what God asks us to do. You know, and healing will take place. Workplace at the River is hosting weekly Thursday Biz Talks. Come join us as we have our lineup speakers sharing from their years of career experience. For further information, visit our website. See you online. During this season, we will be collecting our tithe and offering online. Here are the details. Stay connected on the latest happenings by following us on social media at SIBKL Church. Have a blessed service together. I would advise myself to marry a good wife so that I walk straight and have beautiful children. That's exactly what I have now. See, I listen to myself. Build my spiritual word bank and oh yeah, buy gold. Love your mom. Love all the women in your family. Care for them, honor them, give them the best because that's the best training you will get for loving your wife and your kids, your three daughters, and, and maybe more. I would take every woman possible just to talk and crack ridiculous <laughs> jokes with my girls and most importantly, be the friend that they need. That life is not a sprint, it is a marathon. Hang on to Jesus for dear life in all circumstances, even if you don't understand, for He will help calm the storms and bring out the best in us. Those days, eh? I was at my prime of my career and I was traveling a lot of places, a lot of countries in the world in my job. I wish then I have more time to spend with my children. Be more involved in my children's school work, which I miss out due to the nature of my work. It is okay for you and your children to make mistakes. Just remember to walk with them as a friend and as a family. Putting quality time and energy when your children are young and have unbounded energy. To deal differently with each child according to their own love languages and uh, also to build more prayer altars, right? intentional prayer altars and word time with the kids as they are younger. To spend more quality time with my children 
when they were younger. Before long, you know, the, the growing years, I miss them and the, their growing years just ran ahead of me. You got a friend in me You got a friend in me You just remember what your old man said You got a friend in me Oh yeah, happy Father's Day all, yeah Father's here, a happy Father's Day. Now, let us worship our Father in heaven. Thank Him for His amazing grace and love for us. Oh, thank you, Lord, that you are such a wonderful Father, that you have loved us with an everlasting love. Yes, Lord, we thank you. Oh, we praise you. We praise you. We sing who breaks the power. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness. Whose love is mighty and so much stronger The King of glory, the King above for kings Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder The King of glory, the King above This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free 
Hello Church, hi SIBKL, hello everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in online to our Father's Day weekend service. Um, it is a special weekend because it is Father's Day. And before um, I open the Word of God and we read the Word of God together, um, can I just take two to three minutes just to honor the fathers today? Fathers, wherever you are at home, um, we're in the Asian culture, so usually the honored guest gets the first seat at the table. The honored guest gets to sit down. So all fathers in the house, take your seats or don't stand up if you're already sitting. Everybody else, could you rise to your feet and honor all our fathers today? Lay hands on him. If you want to give him a hug, you can. You can give him a kiss if you want. You can. Tell him how much you love him. We're all in our own homes. We should be very comfortable. But allow me to just say a prayer over all the fathers. Uh, to bless the fathers through all of you today. You know, I, I just remember that there may be a group of people that you may not be with your fathers today. Your father may be overseas or in another city, somewhere else. You're not physically with your father. Would you remember your father in your heart today? Would you raise your hands and wherever your father is, you may not even know him, but raise your hands to God because he knows your father. And Would you just bless your father today? Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, today we want to honor all the fathers and we want to say thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have instituted fatherhood in all our lives, Father God. That we fathers, we may not be the best of men. That we fathers, we may not be the most eloquent in expressing our emotions. We may not be the biggest and, and best talkers in the families. But Father God, you know all our hearts and we work because we want to provide for our family. We work because we want the best for our family. And this is a difficult season for fathers because some of us here, we may not have a job. Some of us here, we may be struggling to keep our job. But Father God, today, I just want to say, may your favor be upon them. May you go before them and, and your presence bless them in their workplace, Father God, as they go out to find work uh, um, off our hands to be able to provide for our families. We thank you, Lord Jesus. May today be the day where fathers and sons reconcile, fathers and mothers reconcile, where fathers and daughters reconcile, Lord Jesus Christ. So we want to bless all the fathers today and say thank you, Jesus, that you continue to watch over every single father, their health, their work, and the smile on their hearts. We thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, 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 you may all take your seats now, find a comfortable spot on the sofa because, hey, I'm so excited to bring the Word of God um, into the house uh, this morning because we're continuing our Nehemiah series. And, uh, you know, I, I, the more I read on this chapter, the more I find that, hey, you know, Nehemiah is almost like a father figure to Jerusalem, right? He comes in, he has a heart for Jerusalem. He has the heart to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And he's almost like a father figure. So we're going to jump straight into Nehemiah chapter 2. The verses will come up on the screen, but if you have your Bibles with you, that, that will be the, the perfect uh, uh, way to read the Word of God. So would you turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 2. I'm going to read from verse 1 um, all the way to verse 9. And then I'm going to pray for the sermon. Is that okay? You're with me? All right, here we go. Verse 1. <clears throat> in the month of Nisan, that is the month before Toyota and the month before Honda. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. I promise you that is my one and only dad joke uh, this uh, morning. Um, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I, who is Nehemiah, took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. You see, <clears throat> Nehemiah looked sad in the presence of the king. And in those times, it is an honor to serve in the king's court, right? Um, and, and to be a cupbearer is to be one of the most trusted advisors and aid to the king. So the king expected people to be close, who are close to him to be happy. You, sh you should be happy serving the king. But this guy, Nehemiah, was sad. And we read in chapter 1 that he's sad because he's been fasting. And when he heard that the Jerusalem walls were broken down, burned by fire. So he's sad. So he fasted and prayed. So that's why he looked ill. But he's not ill. Uh, uh, let me continue. I was very much afraid. Verse 3. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? 
verse 4. Now, verse 4 and verse 5 is where I'm really going to focus uh, uh, on in this sermon. The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Verse 6, Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, How long will your journey take? And when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct when I arrive in, Jeru- in Judah? And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, So he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me. Oh, I'm going to repeat that again. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. Give me 30 seconds. Can I commit this time to God? Thank you, Father God, for this time and the reading of your word, the word that is provided for us, that you've called for us to consecrate on our hearts, Father God. Holy Spirit, we give you permission today to enter our heart wherever we are in the world, to enter our homes wherever our homes are in the world, and to just speak to us this morning, to speak to us with a still small voice and to convict us to change our lives today on Father's Day. We give you full permission, God. We give you full permission. We thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, this is a great portion of Scripture because... Um, Nehemiah, you, you, you could see that Nehemiah had a burden for Jerusalem. He had a burden to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild its walls. And when I, the more I read this, the more I keep asking myself, why did he have such a burden? Why did he have such a concern for the walls of Jerusalem? What, what was it? Because it's never explicitly defined in this book why Nehemiah felt this passion that grew inside him to go back to rebuild the walls. So much passion till he cried, till he wept, till he fasted, till he prayed so many times that we found uh, in this book. Why do you think Nehemiah did? So today I want to focus about building our spiritual wall. Building our spiritual wall. Because on Father's Day, Nehemiah, the way I see it, is almost like a like a father to Jerusalem at that time. He goes back and says, you know, I care for you. I want to work for you. I want to make sure you're safe. I want to make sure you're protected. That's almost like a father's heart. And I'm not talking specifically to males who are fathers. I'm talking to everybody because Nehemiah have like a father type heart that we can all have to build our spiritual wall around us, around our families, around our community, around our church and around our nation. And, and that's why today I chose, I chose to film this sermon at a very specific hour uh, uh, that is not so bright out there. I'm overlooking the city. Of course, ideally, I'll be like um, overlooking the whole city of KL, but you know, hey, I don't have that kind of access. So this is what we have. This is what I have. Um, as I preach, I wanna, I wanna give all of us an imagery that out there, we understand what it means to live in a gated community, don't we? Like we want to, we're, we're from KL. Who doesn't want to be in a gated community? Who doesn't want to be in a guarded community? If we live in a high rise or a condominium, there's so many security, right? There's a guard house, then there's probably the lift, the lobbies. Uh, Then of course, there's your front door. Why do we value walls so much? And every country have a border that, that we protect because we don't want people to come in freely, willy up to their own will. Why do we human beings value walls? value borders, value a a sense of separation between me and you. We value it. And there's so many reasons in this world. But today, I want to just go through the book of Nehemiah to see what are Nehemiah's reasons and what we can learn from them. Is that all right? So I'm going to say, what is the significance of a city without walls? What is the significance of a city with walls? And they're all found in here. And I, I found three points each that Nehemiah specifically says. Point one really is this. A city without walls is a defeated city. 
A city with walls is a protected city, a blessed city. I'll say it again. A city without walls is a defeated city. A city with walls is a protected city. And I take this, and I found this in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3. And I'll read it for you. It says this, They said to me, Those who survived the exile and are back in the province, Jerusalem, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned by fire. See, when you don't have city walls, it says, Nehemiah feels that they are in great trouble. They are in disgrace. Why? Because you're vulnerable to attacks. At any time, a foreign nation can come in and just take over your city. At any time, robbers that just pass by can just come in and rob your city. And back in those days, you know, the city formed around the town hall or the palace or the temple, right? And all around it, you'll be residential houses. And then further out from there, there'll be vineyards. And that's where you plant your crop. That's where you keep your chickens. That's where you keep your cows, right? Um, So if you don't have city walls to protect your assets and your interests, anybody can just come by and attack you and take away uh, your children, take away your possessions, your assets, whatever they want to take, because you have no city walls. That is exactly why if you read the whole book of Nehemiah, there are people who came against Jerusalem because Nehemiah wanted to build the city walls. They fought against Nehemiah with every tactic they can have because they know once the wall come up, they can no longer extort the city. They can no longer rob the city. They can no longer attack the city without having a a surmountable force to do so, right? So that's why there's a lot of enemy that that came against Nehemiah at that time. And it really reminds me of our lives. If we don't have spiritual walls, we live in a defeated mindset. We live in a defeated state. Let, let, me, let, me, let me try to explain this. The way I see it now is that in our world, if we don't build our spiritual walls around ourselves or our families, we are susceptible to be influenced by whatever worldly influence want to come and influence us and our family, right? But can you imagine if there's a spiritual wall, and I'll explain very soon, we're protected from it to a certain extent that we want to be protected by it, right? From it, right? Let me, let me give you an example. A community behind me, you can see a city, a gated community or in a condominium where you've got a lot of security measures, right, before you come in. Imagine if you have none of those. You're susceptible to robbery, you're susceptible to extortion, you're susceptible, susceptible to anybody coming in to to, to do, whatever, do whatever they want to do to you, right? Take a car or whatever it is, right? Um, and in this day and age, we don't need a physical wall for foreign influence to come into our homes. They come in via the television. They come in via the internet, your mobile phones, right? We're so susceptible in the day and age of social media that, that people are, are suing social media platforms and they're spending millions hundreds of millions of dollars to try to curb fake news. How can we protect ourselves from fake news? How can you discern what's a real news? What's a fake news? Don't you find yourself asking that now these days a lot? What about, it takes it one step further. What about deep fakes? If you've not heard of it, you can Google it. What are deep fakes? Where people can just put my face on another video and say something completely absurd and it looks so real that it, that it just, it takes over reality, really, but it's a fake video, right? What about social media platforms or whatever platform that you're on now that is really, really popular, right? There's so many fascist propaganda out there that you can't really tell. um, What what is the ideology of this author before he writes whatever he writes, right? Do do, do I want to believe in him or do I not believe in him? I, I can't really tell anymore. What about all the sexualized content that are readily available out there? What about all the gambling content that are readily available out there? What about all the predatory content that are readily available out there? And while I'm 36, I may be able to discern what is fake, what is not. But what about my children? I have two young children. What kind of world are they growing up in? And if I don't start building spiritual walls around my family, 
I can only imagine that one day they're gonna take the phone and I cannot always be there to see what they're watching. They can just tune into something on YouTube or TikTok or Facebook or Instagram or whatever platform you're on, right? Or they have in 20 years time and they can just watch a five second clip of a sexualized content or a gambling content or a predatory content or fake news, whatever it is, or some propaganda out there and they get brainwashed. We need spiritual walls. And Nehemiah says, I need to go back to build spiritual walls because it is found in, 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 in chapter 1, verse 9. It says, 8 to 9, it says, If you are unfaithful, God says, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me, if you obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the Father's horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to a place I have chosen as my dwelling for my name. Oh, that word dwelling is such a great word. It means that God has chosen to settle down in the city. And in, in this day and age, we don't have a city uh, where, where we go back and worship God because we are that city, right? We are then that dwelling place of God. And God says, oh, I've chosen you to dwell in your heart to settle down in your heart and I will be your spiritual walls and I will be able to tell you and to help you discern what is right and what is wrong, what is fake and what is real, what is good and what is bad because I dwell within you. I settle in your heart. You see, it's all got to do with the word influence. Who is the bigger influence in your lives? Are we ready to build a spiritual wall to keep the negative influences out? Or if we don't have the wall, at any Tom, Dick and Harry time, at any second of any day, they can just come in and influence us, whether it's the first thing in the morning or the last thing we see at night. But if we have the Holy Spirit that resides in us, if we have God, Jesus, that lives in us, His light will be that influence. That whenever my kids, and I can only imagine my kids going out there, going to school, uh, talking to friends and getting influenced by whatever they're influenced by, right? And somewhere along the line in their future, something will come in that is negatively going to influence them. I only pray and hope that they have enough Jesus to be able to discern that that is a wrong thing. Because without Jesus, everything becomes right and everything becomes wrong. Everything becomes relative to what you think is right or wrong. We need to build spiritual walls. Then God says, I will dwell with you. I will settle with you. And I will be your light. I will be your plumb line. I will be your yardstick. I will be with you to the ends of the age. Point number one. A city without walls is a defeated city. A city with wall is a protected city. Point number two, a city without walls lives in shame. A city with walls lives in honor. A city without walls lives in shame. A city with walls lives in honor. And I take this from Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17. Let me, let me read it for you. Then I said to them, then Nehemiah said to them, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let's rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. When Nehemiah sees a burned down wall, he sees a city living in disgrace. He sees a city living in shame. And we can resonate because we're Asians, right? We live in a shame on our culture, right? Everything has got to do with my face. Everything's got to do with shame, right? That's why we've got to dress the best. We've got to look the best, even though we don't feel the best, right? But we've got to portray an image to people that we, we feel the best. We are the best, right? And every time there's something shameful that comes our way, we say, mm, mm, I don't want to talk about that shameful thing, right? And, and right now, what is the shameful thing that you're going through? Because back in those days, back in Jerusalem, whenever they see the wall, that is crumbled, they are reminded that they are a defeated nation. Whenever they see a wall that is crumbled, they are reminded that they live in shame. Every time the enemy, you see in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1 to 4, 
you can clearly read that the enemies of Jerusalem mocks them. The enemies of Jerusalem ridicules them. And it's the same for us. What are the things in our lives that we live in shame? That we are reminded of. And every time we see that thing, we are reminded of our shame. Maybe one of our children failed in their school exam and they, and they can't get to Form 4 or Form 5. You can't get to Form 6. You cannot enter university because your results are not good enough. And every time you hear your friends talk about university and school, you are reminded of the shame that, that, that is brought upon your family. Or, or maybe if you're a child, maybe your parents have gone through a difficult, difficult marriage and they're on the brink of divorce. Or some of, some of you are living with divorced parents. And every time you see another family, that their parents are together, you are reminded that you are from a broken family and you live in that shame. Or maybe you've gone through substance abuse. Or maybe you've, you, don't, you can't find work in this time. Or maybe you're going through a very difficult season, whatever it may be, the list goes on and on and on. But the point stands. And every time you think about it, and every time somebody says that key word, you are reminded of your shame. You are reminded that your city walls are broken. And, and it prevents you from coming to church. It prevents you from smiling the next day. It prevents you from enjoying a full life with Jesus Christ. It prevents you from even coming to God because your shame is that barrier. But Nehemiah says, build the walls. Because in verse 20, he said this, <clears throat> I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. Amen, church. I'm going to declare it in your life today. The God of heaven will give you success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, the people, the mockers, the ridiculous, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. What is Nehemiah saying? When you rebuild the walls, you have a share in Jerusalem. You have a claim to it. You have a historic right to it. And I'm going to explain these three big words because with Jesus Christ, we no longer live defeated. We no longer live in shame. What it means when Nehemiah says, you will have a share in Jerusalem. You see, share is, is, is the other translation for the word is portion. We always hear the, the phrase, God is my portion and my strength. It's from the Psalms, right? He's my portion. What does that mean? Another word for portion is inheritance. That God is my inheritance. And, and in the New Testament, we are, we are told that we are heir and co-heirs with Christ. So when we rebuild our spiritual walls, we are reminded that every promise in Jesus Christ is yes and amen. That we inherit everything that in, He inherits, that Jesus is and, have and, and, and has inherited from God His Father. He is victorious from the grave, therefore we are victorious from the grave. He has conquered sin and, and death, therefore we have conquered sin and death. He has got ultimate joy in the Father, and therefore we can live in our joy in God. That is what it means when it says you have a share in the kingdom of God, that God is your portion and your strength, that you have an inheritance with Jesus Christ. And then it goes on to say, or any claim to Jerusalem. The other word for claim really is this, justice or righteousness. We can never change our past. If you failed your exam, if you have taken drugs, if you have tried to end your life, I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but if that is you, if your parents have a rocky marriage, if you are bullied in school, if, if whatever shame that you have in your past, we cannot change it. It has happened. But God says, I will be your righteousness. You can never come back to original right standing, a, a life with no shame. But because Jesus died for you, He clothed you with His righteousness and said, I take away your shame because I died the death you were supposed to die. I take that shame and I clothe you with righteousness. If you are a father today, you may have failed your children you may have failed your wife in the past. You may not be the best father that you think you're supposed to be. And, and sometimes we are reminded of all our failures as a father, right? But God is saying to us today that He is our justice. He is our claim. He is our righteousness. That we can still hold our head up high because God has deemed it right 
in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that we would have life and life abundant and we can still have a future in Him. And he goes on to say, <clears throat> claim or historic right to the city. Historic right is translated as a memorial, as a remembrance of a great city, right? You see, Jerusalem is living in rubbles. It, it, it's, it's in desolation right now. But when you rebuild your city walls, you are remembering the time that, that during the time of King David and King Solomon, Jerusalem was at the height. It is, it is a world superpower in our lives. In our lives, we need to remember our inheritance, our remembrance, not in what we've done. Because every time we remember what we've done, it's not so good, is it? But we remember what Jesus had done for us. That is our claim. That is our spiritual wall. Whenever the enemy says, shame upon you and your family, disgrace upon you and your family, no face to you and your family, Jesus says, I take that shame and I give you honor. I take that shame and I give you righteousness. I take that shame because if you remembered, I died on that cross for you and I resurrected on the third day. So now you can have an inheritance of my kingdom and we would be heirs and co-heirs of the kingdom together. That's a life of honor when we build our spiritual walls. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. No turning back. Point two, a city without walls is a city that lives in shame. But a city with walls is a city with honor. Point number three, and a very short point, a city without walls is a city that lives in fear, afraid. But a city with walls stand strong. Upright, I stand strong. Where did I get it from? Turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 16. Let me read it for you. It says, <clears throat> When all our enemies heard about this, when the walls have been completed in, verse, in chapter 6, when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. You see, all the other nations before the walls was computed, completed, they, they were bolstered. They, were, they had confidence to attack Jerusalem. All your enemies, if we don't have spiritual walls, they are confident to come into our lives to attack us. But once our walls are up, the enemies are afraid. We no longer live in fear that, will the enemy attack me today? Will the enemy attack me tomorrow or next month? Or, or next year, when is the attack going to happen? We are no longer afraid because we say to the enemy, you can attack me anytime you want, but because my walls are up, because Jesus lives in me, because he is my protector, because he is my inheritance and he is my portion, because Jesus lives in me, you can attack me, but you will never be able to occupy my city. That's the first sermon of the year. Pastor Chu said it. Remember that the enemy can ever, can always come against you. The enemy can always attack you. But with Jesus Christ, the enemy can never occupy our lives. The enemy can never occupy our family. The enemy can never occupy our homes and our heart because Jesus Christ is our portion and our shield. He is our self-confidence. Our enemies become afraid. Why? In 16, Nehemiah says, because they realize that the building of the wall is not done by my efforts. It's done with the help of our God. They realize that God is on our side. Remember in the beginning, how did Nehemiah get so emboldened, so confident? How did Nehemiah approach the king and ask him of such a request? It says, because the gracious hand of God was on him. And in the gracious hand of God is on all our lives. The enemy, our enemies, will have no choice but to shudder 
and fear. We don't fear them. Now they fear us when we know who we are in Christ Jesus. The big question is this. What are our spiritual walls? How do we build our spiritual walls? And Nehemiah says it very clear. It's almost, to me, it is the best verse of the whole book. The most meaningful one. It is found in the first chapter. I'm going to read it for you. First chapter, verse 8 and verse 9. It says, God says, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me, if you obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as my dwelling for my name. That's how we build our spiritual walls. And I know it's a very simple application, an application that many sermons have said before, obedience. Coming back to God, obey. Coming back to God and obey. What are our spiritual walls? The Word of God that surrounds us, that protects us. And how do we activate that spiritual wall? Obedience. We choose to obey. And when we choose to obey, Scripture says, God then choose us as His dwelling place. Amazing. Such a simple application for so many advantages to have a, a spiritual wall. Just to obey. And many of us, we don't know the Word of God. We don't know how to obey. And I'm just going to encourage you, open up your Bible, speak, come and join our cell group, come and join our church, come and watch our sermons week in and week out. And we will, we will always open scriptures and we will tell you what the Word of God says. And that is all we need to obey. Now, what does Nehemiah 1 verse 9 says? It says this, even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them there and bring them home. And if today you feel like you are at the farthest horizon from God, you feel like you, you live in so much shame that nobody can save you, you feel like you have lived in so much defeat that nobody can give you victory. You feel like you live in so much fear, fear of sickness, fear of death, fear of jobs, fear of people. You live in so much fear that nobody can help you. I want to give you a good news because the Bible says that even if you are at the farthest horizon, no matter how far you run, God will gather you and bring you back home. And He will choose to dwell with you and to be your hope, to protect you, to bless you, to honor you, and to give you strength to stand tall with your head up high and says, I know to whom I belong. And if, if that is you, and you've been far from God, Today on Father's Day is the perfect opportunity to come back to God. The perfect opportunity says, God, I, I need you in my life once again. You know, the, on Father's Day, you know, I'm a young father. And I, I, I'm not the kind of guy that needs a lot of gifts from my families, um, for my family. But there's one image that I'm going to show that really touched me as a father. It's an image of my elder son holding my younger son in his arms. And it just gives me joy. I can't explain it. It's, a, it's an amazing feeling to know that my, my two sons love each other. They, want, they will grow up knowing each other, that one day I may not be here, but they will have each other. My, my wife, their mother may not be here, but they will have each other. And that brings me joy to see them home, holding each other. That's the same joy that God has if you say, I want to come back home. And I want my brothers and sisters to hold me in their arms, my family members to hold me and to smile with me and to say, I, 
I know where I belong. This is where I belong. I've ran away from God long enough. I've run far enough. Today is time to stop running. And I'm going to ask you to obey. And if that is you, if there's a stirring in your heart, to obey that stirring and to say, I want to receive Jesus Christ into my life today. And if that is you, can I invite you to just, and everybody at home, to just close your eyes. If that is you, could you repeat this prayer after me? And say, I want to invite you, Jesus. I want to know my real Father today. I want to be fathered by the God of heaven today. I want Him to dwell with me. Would you pray with me? And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give an arbitrary count of three, just to prepare you, that God loves you. On the count of number three, I will pray and I invite you to pray with me. One, God invites you to come back home. That God says, if you return to me and obey my commands, I will come to you. Number two, He would freely accept you with open arms and He will give you unspeakable joy and unspeakable love. And number three, if that is you, would you pray this prayer with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I confess all my life I've ran far from you. I've done so many wrong things. But I acknowledge that you, Jesus Christ, died for all my sins. You, Jesus Christ, are resurrected on the third day. And you, Jesus Christ, I receive into my life. Come and live in me, with me, and teach me the ways everlasting. Your love, your joy, your protection. Give me honor. Let me hold my head up high. Let me stand strong again today on Father's Day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, church. And if that is you, could you fill in? If you said that prayer for the very first time, could you fill in this link below? Because we want to follow up with you and we want to call you and say, Hi, welcome to the family. But for the rest of us here, could you just rise to your feet today and can we just sing this closing song, The Goodness of God. God bless you, church. Happy Father's Day.
was a powerful message from the Lord that was given just now. If you've been touched by it and you would like to be prayed for, there is this QR code that you can scan with your smartphone or a link that you can click on that will bring you to our online prayer room. There will be pastors and leaders there who would love to engage with you and to pray with you. Some of you may have even accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour for the very first time today. And we would also like to engage with you and journey with you. So there is this other link that you can click on. If you're joining us for the first time and you've enjoyed the service tremendously, do drop us a line. SIBKL has always been known to be a generous church. I want to thank all of you so much for your generous contribution to the tithes and offering. So there's the details that are here. Do click on it and to contribute online. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for today's service and we would love to see you again next week for our next week's service. But throughout the week, we have our 10pm devotion or God's Word. Do join us for this. Stay safe, stay connected and God bless till we meet again. Just one breath, you awaken life in me. You open my eyes, now I've seen you face to face. One moment of love, now I'll never be the same. Holy Spirit. Yeah.
Let your will 